Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for very the welcome. introduction. I'm delighted to be here, and I just want to congratulate the organizers of this fantastic event. I have to fess up that I did ask Neve Connolly for a walk-on song, which she said no to. <laughs> well, I'm kind of annoyed, but apart from that, everything is good. So I'm going to talk about interprofessional education and practice. And what I'm going to talk about, obviously, is simulation. I'm going to talk about how we're using simulation for interprofessional education and practice. And by doing that, we've been recognized as an international center for excellence in simulation by the Association for Medical Educators in Europe, who a lot of people will know are a tough crowd. But what it means for us is that we now have a world-class simulation facility on our site. And that's not just me saying that, because I like to say that all of the time, but that is something that has been defined by international experts. I also want us to all start thinking about how we can use simulation more to achieve both of our organization's strategic goals, so that's SAILTA and the college. And we need to think about how we use simulation to change how we deliver health professions education. So I'm well aware that change is particularly difficult. I think we've heard a lot of that today. And even when we know we should be changing, sometimes we don't, and it requires maybe a huge push or something that comes very close to us to make us change. And we know, and it's no secret, that we have a lot of problems in healthcare, and a lot of people have spoken about it today. We have problems with systems, culture, organizations. When error happens, we blame, and we have a culture of blame. Again, people have spoken about this, but we don't look after our healthcare staff. And we have a patient who told us earlier how important it is to do that. High levels of burnout, anxiety, stress, suicide. And this is a, quite a nice uh, opening statement from uh, Neve Humphreys at the RCSI, which speaks to this. And she said, it's difficult to see how change will happen in a situation where policymakers are unaware of the challenges faced by hospital doctors, where hospital doctors feel powerless to improve their working conditions or the system, and where emigration remains a viable option for, for those hospital doctors seeking to improve their working conditions. So that was earlier this year. Error, we have quite a lot of error and multiple investigations and reports coming through over the last year around the problems we have when we're trying to deliver a standard of care. And sometimes we fall short for that standard and we harm patients. I think one of the most famous reports is probably the Francis Report. It's published almost 10 years ago, but it's a damning report. Uh, it was published in the wake of the events at the Mid-Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust, where up to 1,200 people died between 2005 and 2009 due to substandard care. And we're spending a lot of money, healthcare is spending a lot of money in litigation um, and for claims and error. So there are complexities in the healthcare system, and it's not that easy just to say we can change it. But we must change the way we educate our healthcare professions. We're really good at producing great doctors, great nurses, OTs, physios, but we don't train them how to work as a team. They just come out doing their thing. I don't know if anybody here is a Lego fan or a Lego movie fan, possibly not. But it's a great analogy as to explain to people, the public, how we do business. So these are the Lego master builders. My favorite is Batman. <laughs> uh, um, and they have great expertise in what they do. But they couldn't save the universe because they were so siloed. And it took Emmett, our hero, in the, <laughs> in the Lego movie to bring them together and to make them make a plan to change and conquer the universe. Something to think about. Okay, this is modern healthcare education. This is in the simulation lab across the road, and you can see how many professions are in this shot, and it's just one shot. You don't have the other side of the screen. We have anesthetics, we have obstetrics and gynecology, we have theater nursing, we have midwifery. We have hematology, laboratory staff, and uh, hemovigilance officers, all in this simulation together. I'm pointing it in the wrong direction, I think. And this is what simulation is about now. Things have changed, and how we do business has changed. Simulation-based education is an educational, 
or training method that is used to replace or amplify real experience with guided experiences. And I think in Ireland we're most comfortable with the amplification rather with replacing. But in the US, we replace with simulation. So it's something to think about. It's not defined by a technology, but rather an educational approach grounded in learning theories. So it's not about the equipment. And in 2022, healthcare simulation has become widely adopted for health professions education at all stages of training. So it may have been a little bit slow in the undergraduate sphere, but it's now at all stages. And across the cognitive, procedural, communication and teamwork domains. So again, your perception of simulation may be surgeons training to do skills, but it's more and more in the domains of communication and teamwork. And this is something interesting. This is fairly new, and Victoria Brazel, who's a big sim person, talks a lot about this. We talk about translational simulation, which describes healthcare simulation focused directly on improving patient care and healthcare systems. And you can do it through two ways. You can use simulation to diagnose your problem, to look at your systems, or you can use it as an educational intervention, and we do both. And the design of these simulations is focused on systems and processes rather than the individual team, knowledge, and skills. And a lot of our traditional education is focused on the individual's knowledge and skills, and sometimes on the team, but not so much. So I like this picture, so I'm coming back to it. And I want you to have a good look at this picture. So this picture is, is a postpartum hemorrhage simulation. And I think you get a real sense from this picture that this is not about just knowledge and skills. There's much more going on here. There's the team, and there's the messy, complex, horrible system that we work in as healthcare providers. Look at the clock. The clock says 0321, the worst time to be delivering care, short-staffed, tired. Look at the number of nurses there are in the room. We're short about three. And we've put in a new piece of equipment there that they've never used before, which is the blood transfuser. It's a different one to what they're used to. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to mimic the system so that we can promote two things, psychological safety and reflexivity in our teams. And if we can do that in the simulator and train people to take that out into the clinical floor, then we're making progress. So it's not all staying in the simulator, it must translate out. And we now understand that simulation is not a container with sides at the start and the end, but it's a leaky container. And what we teach leaks out, not just knowledge and skills. You can't just do things better after the simulation. You're a better team worker, you're more reflective, and you, and, uh, you bring your psychological safety out into the practice. We need to stop with this when it comes to education. We've always done it this way. We need to change. So team reflexivity refers to the extent to which group members reflect and communicate about the group's objectives, strategies, and processes, allowing them to interpret their accomplishment and prepare for future action. It's not dissimilar to a description of interprofessional education, and it's not dissimilar similar to the Lego master builders and how they went and did their business. They made a plan together. And psychological safety is a shared belief held by members of the team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. And that's what we want to translate out. It's directly linked to real-world uh, team performance through the impact of interprofessional risk-taking or speaking up behaviors, teamwork behaviors, and team learning. And that's telling you that if you learn it in simulation, it'll translate out and things will be better. It's important that teams have these skills, reflexivity and psychological safety, because we know a single profession or discipline does not hold all the answers to the types of complex problems that we're currently facing. So interprofessional education and practice are an educational intervention, and they're on a spectrum. Interprofessional education is usually something that we do in the undergraduate program with students, and interprofessional practice is something we hope that in the clinical setting, teams and team members do on a regular basis, and one way to do that is through simulation. And this is a definition that's sort of a recognized definition and one that I kind of threw a few bits into. Interprofessional education occurs when members or students of two or more profession uh, uh, my is very bad, learn about from and interactively with each other to enable effective collaboration 
and improve health outcomes and quality of care. And I think the important piece is the interactive learning. The other piece that's important is that it is across the continuum. So the education is the undergraduate and the practice is the postgraduate. And those two must exist together. I think this is what people think interprofessional education is. Lots of professions all in a room together. But it isn't. This is what it is. It's mushed together. There's overlap. It's a little bit messy. Um, but it's collaborative and this is how we think about it. And it's a good way to think about it, I think. Mm -hmm. Barriers and enablers. Of course there are barriers. There's lots of them. Um, we need to be able to demonstrate the relationship between interprofessional education in our undergraduate programs and that translating out into the floor and lifelong learning. So there's research to be done there. The culture is rotten and we have to change the culture. The culture of siloed teaching um, and siloed working. Funding is a huge problem because this is a different way of teaching. But on the positive side, the accreditation bodies are demanding this. Medical Council and the Nursing and Midwifery Board want this in their undergraduate programs. In Canada, they're very successful at this and they did it by bringing about offices of interprofessional education in every medical school. So they put their hand up and said, this is how we do business. The good thing about interprofessional education and practice is that it is an educational intervention and that means that we can research it and that engages people even more. And even better again, it's seen as an innovation. So this quote is coming from Canada and it really is very important because this is how we do business. And the quote says, in order to really bring concepts of interprofessional education into practice, health authorities, hospitals and other provided organisations need to partner with universities and use their resources to help translate the ideals taught to students into practice. And that is what is critical to the success of this. And that's what we do in the simulation facility. Interprofessional simulation based education for everybody. And we have a few key rules to help us do that. First of all, everybody teaches and everybody's voice is important, including the patient. Second of all, we promote psychological safety. We also assume that people are coming with positive intent. So we, bring, we take that on board. And we teach people to ego up and ego down. So we teach people to get over themselves so they can work as a team. We also are committed to improving patient outcomes and to working with processes and systems to make them better. This is a photo from a simulation in the cath lab where they had a problem with the massive transfusion protocol when uh, bleeding started. And we were committed to making that better. And we have a determined, committed team. So change in this space requires a couple of things. Determination, or what we call grit. Not taking no for an answer. Getting over yourself. Egoing up, if you're maybe a nurse, and egoing down, if you're a doctor. Depends. Promotion of psychological safety, so that's a capacity to stick your head above the parapet and to take a risk to share interprofessionally. A change in our culture, everyone teaches is a change in the culture. The basic assumption, so everybody is intelligent and we assume intent, a positive intent. And being able to self-assess, knowing your barriers and your limitations. I'm going to finish with a short video which just shows you how we do business. It's just one minute, just over a minute. And this is why I'm interested in simulation and in the future, because simulation is the future of healthcare education. I intend to spend time in the future and we're all going to be health service users at some point. So I'm just going to play the video. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much.